Welcome to Down to Earth but Heavenly Minded Podcast. Hosted by Irving Rich, The Way of Life. Being. Notes of Lectures Delivered in Scandinavia, 1904. By J. Boyd. Revised. London, G. Morrish, 20, Paternoster Square. 1906. Life and Judgment, John Chapter 5 verses 1 to 29. The contrast in this chapter is between life and judgment. The one who receives life does not come into judgment. There is the resurrection of life and the resurrection of judgment. Those who come into judgment never see life. Jesus tells us that whoever hears his word and believes on him that sent him has eternal life and shall not come into judgment, but is passed out of death into life. Judgment has no application to those who come under the life-giving power of the Son of God, it has to all others. Adam brought in sin and death, and death passed upon all his descendants irrespective of their own personal disobedience. Babies die who have not sinned. It is impossible that God could allow man to continue forever a life of sin. Life may be lengthened out to nigh a thousand years, or it may be closed in as many minutes, but it must be brought to a close, for man is by nature sinful. But that the power of death might be broken the Son of God has died, and life is available for all in him risen from the dead. He is the last Adam and the last Adam is a life-giving spirit. He is the fountain of life. All connected with the first Adam come under death, but all are directed to the last Adam for life. But no one could have been quickened had the Son of God not died. Chapter 3 speaks of the lifting up of the Son of Man and of the revelation of the love of God, their two things were necessary if men were to be made to live. Sin had to be dealt with and death annulled, for man was under sin and subject to death, and only one could sustain the judgment due to sin and by death break death's power. But in the death of Christ death has been annulled and the love of God has been declared, and life is therefore possible for man. For it is by the love of God being made good to the heart that men are made to live. Out of death as brought in by Adam all men will be brought. Resurrection will accomplish this, and the wicked will be raised from the dead as well as the righteous. But the wicked will not be quickened with the life of the last Adam and theirs will be a resurrection of judgment, and this will result in the second death. Whoever perishes, perishes not on account of Adam's transgression, but on account of his own. Man will be taken out of the death that Adam brought upon all. The Lord says to John in Patmos, I have the keys of death and hell. He has invaded Satan's stronghold, death's domain, and he has all authority there now. Keys signify that he has authority in that sphere, therefore there is an hour coming in which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good to the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. In Revelation chapter 20 we get the great white throne and the resurrection of judgment, and all are judged according to their works, not according to Adam's work but according to their own. And all not written in the book of life are cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death. I do not doubt all that are written in the book of life are in the resurrection of life, which takes place a thousand years before the resurrection of judgment. To bring man out of death into life the Father and the Son were working. When the Jews found fault with Jesus for doing good to men on the Sabbath day, he answers, My Father works hitherto, and I work. They would have limited the activities of divine love to six days in the week. But in a world of sin, death and human woe there could be no Sabbath for Jesus. It was impossible for the love of God to rest in a world like this. So we find Jesus going down to the pool of Bethesda, that scene of misery, on the Sabbath. A multitude of poor afflicted creatures were there whose physical condition set forth the spiritual and moral condition of God's earthly people. The pool was at the sheep market. The people were under the iron rule of the proud Roman and were, so to speak, being bought and sold. They were under hard and cruel bondage. They had been, up to the coming of Christ, viewed as Jehovah's sheep, but they had wandered from him and were reaping the sad consequences of the departure from him. And their spiritual condition was as bad as was their physical condition, they were blind, halt, withered. They were unable to see, and they were unable to walk rightly, and the blight of death was upon them. Bethesda means the house of mercy. A little of the mercy of God toward his people was ministered by angelic means for the healing of the diseases. An angel went down at a certain season into the pool, and troubled the water. Whosoever then first after the troubling of the water stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. It was not mercy suited to the weakest, the man who needed it least got it. For it would be the strongest who would be best able to get in first. A man was there who had been ill thirty and eight years. He had often seen the water moved and had made his best effort to get in first, but his inability to avail himself of the mercy of God was more and more brought home to his consciousness. Again and again while he was coming another stepped down before him. He might as well have been a thousand miles away from the pool. 
it was no good to him to step in second, no one must get in before him. Its virtue to heal was all spent upon the first comer. It was like the law in this respect, which was given by the disposition of angels, it would have been a mercy to man had he been able to avail himself of the blessing it proposed. But he must keep the whole law, if he offend in one point he becomes guilty of all. But what a contrast there was between Jesus and that pool. He was the true Bethesda. All the mercy of God had come near to man in his person, and the mercy which was in him was available for all. It was not only to be made good to the first comer, but to the last as well as first. There was light for the blind in him. Not only was there light for his sightless eyes, but there was the love of God there to illuminate his dark heart. There was power in him to make the lame walk, and not only strength for his feeble limbs, but power to enable him in his walk through this world to fulfill the righteous requirement of the law. Jesus was able to make him walk to the glory and praise of God. If the withered were there, there was the power of God in the person of Jesus to bring the flush of health to the cheek and make the feeble frame thrill with life. And not only this, but life was there that was able to place man beyond the reach of death, so that he might live forever in the light of God. Light, power and life were all in his person and brought near to men, and unlike the pool whose virtue was exhausted by the first who used it. The blessings that were and are in Jesus cannot be exhausted by appropriation. Truly he was the true Bethesda. Therefore the only question now is, wilt thou be made whole? It is not now a question of what God will do, he has done everything needful for your deliverance. It is now only a question of your willingness to be healed by Jesus. Outside of him there is no mercy for man, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. The whole question is, will you submit to the one in whom God has placed every blessing for you? Will you have Christ in whom everything is established? This man gets strength to carry his bed, and he carries it. It was the Sabbath day, and the religious prejudices of the Jews were shocked by the man's profanity. They inform him that it is the Sabbath and that it is not lawful for him to carry his bed. But he had now come under new authority. What had the law of Moses done for him? He had been under it for thirty-eight years, bedridden and helpless. It had not healed him. It had given him no ability to carry his bed. What did he owe that law? The power he now possessed was not derived from the law and the law had no right to control it. Jesus had crossed his path and had made him perfectly whole. He was a strong man now. No sense of feebleness weighs upon him as he carries that which for so many years had carried him. His bed that was once the witness of his weakness is now the witness of his power. And surely the one who bestowed upon him this power was the only one who had a right to say on what day that power was to be exercised. What right had the law to control a power that it was not able to give? He that made me whole, the same said to me, take up thy bed, and walk. This was unanswerable. The power was to be directed by the one who gave it. It is thus with the believer in Jesus, he is not under the law, but neither is he lawless, he is subject to Christ. And because Jesus had done this good work upon the poor palsied man the Jews persecuted him and sought to slay him. But Jesus lets them know that in finding fault with him they were finding fault with the Father. He says, My Father works hitherto, and I work. This only enraged them more, for he was making himself equal with God. Still, whatever they might think, his works proceeded from the Father, for he did nothing but that which he saw the Father do. In this he was presenting to them the grace of the heart of God, but they were blind to it. What a sad state to be in. They refused to believe in the kindness and love of a Saviour God when manifested before their eyes. Man was under death and subject to judgment, and Father and Son were working to rescue him. The Father raised up the dead and quickened them and the Son quickened whom he would. By the quickening power of Christ man was taken out of the state to which judgment applied. Judgment has no application to the life of Christ, it refers to man's responsible life, to the flesh and its sinful history. In the life of Christ a man is beyond death and judgment. There are two ways in which death can be viewed. First, as the consequence of sin, death by sin, the wages of sin is death. Adam brought this in, but Christ will abolish it, and all men will be taken out of it. Secondly, moral death, he does not live to God. If a man loves God he lives, if he loves not God he lives not. This is what Christ refers to here. Men are made to live to God by his life-giving power. The wicked will be raised, but they will not be quickened, they will not be placed beyond the reach of death, for the second death will be their portion. The way the sun quickens is by causing his voice to be heard in the hearts of men, the hour comes and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God. And they that hear shall live. This hour is now present. An hour in scripture is a period of time marked by a certain event. 
This hour is the hour of quickening. It has lasted nigh two thousand years, the hour of resurrection and of judgment is coming, and it will last a thousand years at least. The resurrection of life takes place before the age, which we call the millennium, begins, the resurrection of judgment takes place at the close of the millennium. Revelation chapter 20. The present time is the hour in which the life-giving voice of the Son of God is to be heard in the regions of death. He came from heaven to make the love of God known. Everything that he did and said told out that love, but the full declaration of it was in death. He has spoken by an act. His love has not been in word and tongue, but in deed and in truth. He laid down his life for us as the expression of the love of God to us, in this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us, and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. His testimony was the love of God, and this testimony was rendered in death. In chapter 3 you get the Son of Man lifted up and the love of God declared. And in chapter 4 you get the Spirit that you may be able to hear the voice of the Son of God two thousand years after he has spoken. The Holy Spirit sheds abroad in the heart of the believer the love of God, and this is what I understand by hearing the voice of the Son of God. You receive and understand his testimony. And in the life of Christ we are outside all that judgment applies to, verily, verily, I say to you, he that hears my word, and believes on him that sent me, has everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, judgment, but is passed out of death to life. But another hour is coming, an hour in which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice, and shall come forth. It will be a glad sound to some, it will call them from corruption, weakness and dishonor to incorruption, power and glory. But for those who have been deaf to the voice of the Son of God, who have refused to come to Jesus that they might have life, that voice will break upon their ears with indescribable terror. They shall come forth to the resurrection of judgment. Today is the opportunity God gives for men to come to Jesus and receive life, and he has said, Him that comes to me I will in no wise cast out. 